A quick note about today's episode. Features a story involving child abuse and murder. Listener caution is advised. Also, if you think a child is being abused, please report it to the local authorities or even call the National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-4-A-CHILD or 1-800-422-4453. They serve the U.S. and Canada, and the hotline is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have professional crisis counselors who, through interpreters, provide assistance in over 170 languages. The hotline offers crisis intervention, information, and referral to thousands of emergency, social service, and support resources. All calls can remain confidential. The year is 1988, and kids' Halloween's costumes would never be the same after a certain red-headed doll named Chucky would make his first appearance in the horror film Child's Play. Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman would both raise autism awareness and introduce the savant misconception in Rain Man. It would be the highest grossing film and best picture winner that year. Tim Burton would blend horror and comedy like only he can in the smash hit Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Bruce Willis would ignite the genre of the everyman versus the engaging villain. We would see Steven Spielberg and George Lucas collaborate to make a Bambi, but with dinosaurs, in the animated film The Land Before Time. One star of this film would never get to see this completed piece of art. Today, we look at the story of Judy Barcy and how alcohol, abuse, and rage would lead to the unthinkable. Judith Barcy was born on June 6, 1978, in Los Angeles, California, to parents Joseph and Maria Barcy. She would be the couple's only child. Joseph had two other children from a previous marriage, but we will get to that later. Judith's mother almost immediately began training her daughter for a future in Hollywood. Her brother once told her, you know it's like a 1 in 10,000 chance that kids get into show business, right? But Maria wasn't going to let odds stop her. She was a true stage mom, teaching Judith in the ways of posture and poise and working on her enunciation and singing voice. It would all pay off accidentally in 1983 for Judith. A crew that happened to be shooting a commercial at an ice rink noticed her, only five years old at the time, skating gracefully across the ice. This crew would help her land her first commercial job for Donald Duck Orange Juice. She would become a successful commercial actress, and with her agent Ruth Hansen's experience and Judith's skill, would go on to appear in over 70 commercials. It's here I want to take a step back and introduce you a little more to the parents of Judith. Maria and Joseph Barsi had both separately fled the 1956 Soviet occupation of Hungary. Joseph would initially settle in France and marry a fellow Hungarian refugee named Clara. He would then have two children with her, a son named Barna and a daughter named Aggie. Joseph would develop a drinking problem around this time and begin to physically abuse his wife Clara. The family would relocate to New York in 1964 and Joseph would begin to extend his abuse towards his son Barna. This prompted Clara to escape with the children to Arizona in 1969. Although Joseph attempted to reconcile himself with his family, Clara filed for divorce after he threw a cast iron skillet at her in a drunken rage. Shortly after the divorce, Joseph moved to California, where he found work as a plumbing contractor. It's there that he would meet Maria, a waitress at a Los Angeles restaurant that was a well-known gathering place for immigrants. The dark and husky Barcy would sit at the bar, head down over his drinks, for which he paid for with $100 bills. Maria was impressed, seeing in the brooding man dubbed Arizona Joe because he had once lived there, someone who could give her security. Maria herself, a Hungarian immigrant escaping the Soviet occupation, had suffered psychological and physical abuse from her father. 
The two were later married, and Judith's birth quickly followed in Los Angeles, California, where Judith was raised. Now, you may be asking why I brought up that information. There are two reasons. One is to simply say they were both immigrants that had fled from the Soviet control, and to highlight that their life was filled with strife at an early age. The second is to show that violence and mental abuse were not a new phenomenon in Joseph's life. Now that we're back to Judith, she has seen tremendous success in commercials, and even landing guest spots in TV roles like Growing Pains, Punky Brewster, and Cheers. According to her agent, Hansen, part of her success was how young she looked. When she was 10, she was still playing 7 or 8. This was because she was short for her age, standing at only 3 foot 8 inches when she was 10 years old. Her father would continue to work, even as his daughter's star began to rise, leaving Maria to develop quite a bond with her. Judith and her mother got along great. They were close and spent all of their time together. Between commercial shoots and her new television roles, Judith got to spend a lot of time with her mom, reading books and telling jokes. Maria even taught her daughter Hungarian so they would have their own secret language to speak when they were out in public. In 1984, she would play a role in a made-for-TV miniseries called Fatal Vision, playing Kimberly, the daughter of Jeffrey McDonald. Fatal Vision is the true crime miniseries focused on captain and physician Jeffrey McDonald and the February 17, 1970 murders of his wife and their two children at his home in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. In 1979, McDonald was convicted of all three murders and sentenced to life in prison. By 1985, Judith was not a star just yet, but her estimated $100,000 a year income helped buy a modest three-bedroom house in the West Hills area in 1985. Behind the success and smiles, Judith was hiding a dark secret. The young child had been going through a horrible time at home. Her father, Joseph, was not what he had appeared to be. While Maria was doing her best to give her daughter the life she wanted, Joseph was becoming increasingly abusive. As his daughter's fame grew, so did his rage. He seemed to become jealous of his child's ability to provide for their family as he had been having no luck, bouncing from plumbing job to plumbing job. He became paranoid and angry, blaming Judith for anything and everything. When they were outside of the house, he would act as though everything was fine, calling her little one in a loving way. But when they returned home, he would scream at her and her mother and threaten their lives regularly. I want to pause right here to tell you about PodCoin. Are you liking Death in Hollywood? What if I told you PodCoin would pay you to listen to this podcast and others like it? All you have to do is download the free PodCoin app, available on Android or Apple. Then import your favorite podcast and start getting paid to listen. You can even use the promo code HOLLYWOOD and you'll get 300 PodCoins just for signing up. You can use PodCoins to get Amazon, Starbucks, and Target gift cards, or even donate it to charity. So remember to use code HOLLYWOOD when you sign up for your welcome bonus and get started today. And now, back to our story. The brooding enigma and the tragedy is Joseph Barsi, 55, a plumber, ashamed of his Hungarian accent, and who valued family so highly, who has been quoted as saying, if family life is gone, then life is not worth living. Yet by all accounts, he ruled his family forcefully, bludgeoning them not with his fists, but with his words. He seemed perpetually angry at his wife. Barcy told friends that he had no mother or father, a much more stigmatizing defect in Hungary where families stay together than in this country. When they fought, she would use it against him, calling him a bastard. Barcy would alternate his threats in these arguments, sometimes saying he would kill his wife, and other times saying he would kill himself and Judith, and leave Maria alive to suffer. Their neighbors started to notice the issue, with one reporting they had saw Maria hand Judith a new kite to play with, but then Joseph grabbed it from her hands, yelling, you're going to break it. He allegedly looked at the neighbors and said, look at her. She's such a spoiled brat and doesn't want to share her new toy, but instead of giving it back to her 
or just putting it away, he broke the kite into pieces right in front of his daughter. Another family friend, who would give Judith homemade Hungarian sausage when she came to visit, said the girl spoke very darkly of her home life. I'm afraid to go home. My daddy is sad. My daddy is drunk every day, and I know he wants to kill my mother. Joseph's behavior continued to grow more and more erratic and aggressive. Though most of the abuse in the house was verbal, Maria would file a police report against her husband in December of 1986, accusing him of threatening over the last five years to kill her and of choking her and hitting her in the face. Police found no visible injuries, and the wife eventually declined to prosecute. In 1987, Judith would voice the role of Ducky in Land Before Time. Her yep, yep, yep is still remembered to this day by everyone who, like me, watched that movie when they were a kid growing up in the 90s. My name's Littlefoot. Mine is Tucky. Yep, that is what it is. Yep, yep, yep. Don't step on a crack or you'll fall and break your back. Then later, in 1987, Joseph, seemingly unfazed with his earlier close call with police, continued the abuse. When Judith was cast in Jaws, The Revenge, to be shot down in the Bahamas, Maria was scheduled to go with her to the shoot. Before they left, Joseph held a knife to his daughter's throat and said, If you decide not to come back, I will cut your throat. Her father was upset by his daughter's departure, but refused an airline ticket to visit her. When the filming was over, the mother and daughter visited Maria's brother, Weldon, in Flushing, New York, where Judith talked to her father on the phone. Remember what I told you before you left, he said, referring to the knife incident. According to Weldon, the girl was terrified. She cried and dashed off to the bedroom. The mother and daughter cut short their visit and returned to California. When Judith came back, her stress levels rose. According to her agent, when she came back, Judith would begin pulling out her eyelashes as a coping mechanism. The threats continued, and Joseph, even according to his friend Peter Kilden, told me 500 times he was going to kill his wife. I'd try to calm him down. I'd tell him, if you kill her, what will happen to your little one? But Joseph would just say, I guess I'll have to kill her too. It didn't take long after this incident for everything to come crashing down. But unlike other celebrated cases where witnesses turn their back on abuse, neighbors, relatives, and industry people who knew about the threats tried to help. One neighbor offered Maria Barcy refuge in her own home, but she refused. Judith, now 10 years old, broke down at an audition for All Dogs Go to Heaven, and someone finally thought to call Children's Services. Maria brought her daughter to a child psychologist who was able to identify signs of severe physical and emotional abuse, and an investigation was launched. Maria was able to convince the caseworker to drop the investigation after assuring them that she would be filing for divorce and had a plan of action. Maria's plan of action involved moving to a Panorama City apartment, which she rented in May. She would spend her days there with her daughter, then return home at night. The woman had started. She had gotten an apartment, said the caseworker. But she had not taken that child and moved into the apartment. Can we force a woman to do that? Hansen, Judith's agent, urged her to make a final break from her husband, but she kept hesitating, saying in June that she wanted to stay in the neighborhood for Judith's birthday. Then, in July, she said she didn't want to lose her home. Instead, she tried to force Joseph out. Maria told her neighbors that she planned on cashing the tax rebate check that Judith was supposed to receive, and that 12000 would be a good start for their new life, but they would never get the chance. The anger and jealousy Joseph felt for his child and wife erupted on Monday, July 25th, 1988, just one week after Maria had told neighbors she was about to leave. 
Judith was seen riding her bike on the street earlier in that day. But that night, Joseph walked into his daughter's room and shot her in the head. When Maria ran to the room to see what had happened, he shot her as well and then left her body in the hallway. That same day, Judith missed an appointment at Hanna-Barbera Productions. Judith's agent phoned the Barcy house on Tuesday to find out what had happened to cause the no-show. Joseph Barcy told the agent that a big car had already picked up Judith and Maria and that he had planned to leave the home for good and had only stuck around to say goodbye to his little girl. After speaking with the agent, he poured gasoline over the bodies of his wife and daughter and then lit them on fire. He then went into the garage and shot himself in the head. Eunice Daly, the neighbor, remembered hearing the sound of the final gunshot and then seeing the smoke rise above the house and said, that's it, he's done it, he's killed them, and he set a fire in the house. Firefighters were called to the gruesome scene, and it leaves you wondering, how could this happen? What had finally set Joseph off? An investigator said he might have discovered his wife's plan to move out. He also might have found she was planning a divorce, or that his daughter was seeing a psychologist. Maria's brother offered up a different explanation. His marriage was disintegrating, so he killed her and his daughter, just like he had threatened so many times before. I think it was a final act of possession. If I can't have them, nobody will have them. Death left a bitter note. Not only had a father killed the people he professed to love most, but what troubled officials who deal with child abuse is that the social service system had failed to prevent a calamity that it had been warned about. The LA Times reported that there were questions raised against the child's protective services because the investigation should have never been called off. The commission was asked to review their client file for the first time and they were not pleased with how the department handled the case. Helen Kleinerg, a member of the Watchdog Commission for Children's Services, was upset that the CPS closed the case, as it wasn't solved yet. From my point of view, the child was the client, not the mother. She believed that even though the mother claimed to be making an effort to fix it, they should have been monitoring them more closely to prevent this from happening. Judith and her mother were both buried together in unmarked graves shortly after their death. Joseph was buried in an unknown location, likely away from his family. It was 16 years after their passing that the public decided to donate to get them each a proper headstone, giving Judith and Maria the burial they deserved. Judith's headstone features the words, Our Concrete Angel, and under the quote from Land Before Time, her favorite movie and her favorite character. Judith was taken from everyone way too early in her life, and it was hard for me to even write some of this episode as I grew up with her voice, not knowing this had even happened. I hope she knows all the lives she's touched and that she will be missed by so many. Yep, yep, yep. If you like this story, please hit subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this show. If you really like this story and want to help us grow, please share this story with just one friend. You can join the conversation by following us on social media, and if you'd like to support the show by being a producer, you can PayPal Death and Hollywood at gmail.com, and you'll be listed in the credits of the next show. Sources used for this episode are included in the show notes on the website, but they include Wiki, an article from Mamma Mia by Claire Stevens, an LA Times article by John Johnson, and another LA Times article by Sherry Barber.